he literally referred to me as his wife to like acquaintances like full princess treatment like iconic i'm coming back into the men's washroom soon you're gonna eat my pizza i'm gonna block you on everything sit back and relax as today's program guides you through all things pop culture in the deepest corners of the internet warning may cause brain rot Hi everyone and welcome back to Brain Rot, yet another episode with your host Maya V. Henry. I'm so excited. Today is just another solo pod, but we're going to do a deep dive and I'm slowly getting the hang of things around here now that I'm on my third episode. So I feel like I'm kind of settling into how I want the audio to sound. I have the mic closer to my mouth now and I also just wanted it to be more like asmr vibe so I don't feel like I have to like shout into the mic. Um, I'm kind of like figuring out the whole mic thing because I know typically you guys would see someone with like a big mic, like a Shure microphone or something like that, or a Rode mic that's like one of those classic ones. And eventually I'd like to get that. I think we can definitely do that. Um, but for now we, I have these mini ones that are wireless, which are also heaven sent. So I'm so thankful that I have that going on, <laughs> but definitely always in my mind how to improve and how to excel. And I, I was taking some of your guys feedback as well. I know I've had a lot of feedback regarding the double camera system I have going on specifically for solo pods. Um, some of you guys say it's like a bit disorienting when I switch between cameras, but let me know what you think. I kind of want a consensus on that. Um, just cause I feel like sometimes it's nice to have two options and just have a bit more of a cut between without having jump cuts. So that's definitely something I wanted to get out of the way before we got started today. But today we're really doing a deep dive. I wanted to make things more personal. I feel like we had a good intro episode. We had a good episode with Lauren that was more personal, but we're going to deep dive even more so because we all know how this channel started and it was through being personal, sharing life experiences and just talking about everything that goes on, you know? And if you hear any barking, it's literally Elio in the back just saying hello to you guys. Um, and yeah, so we're going to deep dive right in. The weather is becoming fabulous in Toronto right now. It's so warm, so nice. And I just feel like a different person. My sister was saying this to me the other day that I must really get affected by seasonal affective disorder because I literally feel so closed off and sad in the winter. And then as soon as those rays of summer sunshine hit my skin, I feel reborn. I feel like I want to be outside. I love how long the days are and I just love warm weather. Like I love the heat on my skin. Maybe one day I should move somewhere where it's a little bit warmer most of the year. I don't know, but I definitely, um, am feeling that sense of aliveness. I feel like a bear coming out of hibernation and, uh, I've been out doing things. I actually recently went out with friends last weekend. So much fun. I actually wore this shirt when I went out. Um, and and I'm wearing it again for you guys because I think it's so fun. I feel like it matches the vibes here on the podcast. We love a little checkered moment. We got the pillow over there. Yeah, so I went out with friends. It was supposed to be like a girl's night, which it was, um, except we obviously like met up with other people and like it just became a night out, um, which is always fun. I don't know about you guys, but like I love to, once I've had a, a few little drinkies in me, I love to just like, you know, dance like a freak. Like that's my thing. I like to go on the dance floor and just, you know, shake my flat little ass, just like, you know, literally act crazy one of my signature dance moves every single time if you've seen Real Housewives of Beverly Hills first season Kyle with her ponytail like literally doing this a little Camille Grammer moment um at least I like to think that I dance like that <laughs> when I've had too many drinks. Um, but we just went out great music, but I do have a funny little story. So I went to go to the washroom with my one friend and we were headed downstairs, but the women's bathroom had several people in it. There was only, I think two stalls available and the one stall was like completely decimated, which no, thank you. And then I had to wait for the other stall. And I was like, Oh, you know, I had my drinks. I had my liquid courage. I was like, I'm just going to go into the men's washroom. I went into the men's washroom, ladies and gentlemen, it's been like a decade, but I did it. I went back in there. That's a lie. I've probably been into a men's washroom in the past decade, but not that I can remember. And so this was a moment 
And let me tell you, it was hilarious. So I walk in there and there's these two guys in there and they're doing something questionable. Um, there's some powder in the air. They look at me like I am a cop walking into, you know, the precinct. They are terrified. And uh, it's so funny. The one guy had like powder on his face. I don't know what happened because my recollection is a little bit foggy, but I just remember the guy with the powder on his face, literally offering to clean up the bathroom for me, like the, the stall that I was going to go to. He literally like prepares it for me like a gentleman. And then he like literally lays down toilet paper on the seat for me and like prepares the whole washroom for me. And then he's like, it's all yours. Like blah, blah. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, are you kidding me? Like that's never happened to me in my life. That is like boyfriend behavior. Obviously it was like a deranged moment in the men's bathroom at the bottom of this bar. Um, and I just was like, wow, like full princess treatment, like iconic. I'm coming back into the men's washroom soon. Like, what have I been missing out on? No, no, no. Maybe, I don't know. It was just hilarious. So I went in, used the bathroom, whatever, and then I left. Um, but that was, that was a moment. That was, you know, just one of the pit stops on that night. Um, danced crazy. I chatted with this one guy for like maybe 10 minutes. You know, when you're like kind of tired of dancing and I'm pretty sure I was the only one wearing pointy heels, I just wanted to sit for a minute. And then this guy like scooched over on the bench next to me and then just started having like life chats with me. And I'm like thinking, okay, how do I politely gear this away? You know, but then finally at a certain point, I just had to get up and go back and start dancing again because it was the only thing I could do to get away from this guy. Um, obviously I politely like turned him down and whatever, but like, you know, you just want, you're just like want a glass of water and you just want to be left alone and just like take a minute. Like I was bench warming. Like I was just shaking it. Like there was no tomorrow. Um, to like Metro Station or whatever they were playing. They were literally doing so many throwbacks. So fun. And yeah, overall, great, great night. Um, went out afterwards and just, you know, Ubered home. And there was two random guys that came up to me on my way to the Uber. It was just like crawling, like men's city that night. Like, I don't even know what to say. Or maybe they were just like, this girl's drunk. Let's get her number. I don't know. But anyways, I wasn't like belligerent or anything like that. I always drink within my limit, always be safe, always, you know, have your what's about you. But I was also with a group of like 10 people. So it was a hundred percent safe 24 seven. Then I headed home and I feel like even though it was just such a fun night and there's like nothing I can think of that went wrong, I get anxiety the next day. Do you guys suffer from that? It's like this debilitating moment when you wake up the next day after going out and having some alcohol and you just feel like, oh, did I say something wrong? Like, oh, is everyone, are we all like on the same page? Is everything good? Um, did I, you know, offend anyone? Like, I can't remember everything that happened last night. You know what I mean? Like that feeling, like that um, Katy Perry song. You've got to help me out. It's all I've heard last night. Love that song. Anyways, um, so yeah, I just feel like I had a little bit of anxiety, but overall, you know what I told myself, and I'm kind of getting into this habit. It's kind of like mitigating your anxiety period. It's not even just to do with drinking because like I really don't go out that often. Um, but just telling yourself to be okay with rejection, to be okay with confrontation, and that you're a human being and you can make mistakes, you know? Like I always tell myself like, oh, like what if I said something wrong and like someone has a grudge against me and, and they hate me and, you know, maybe it comes from a childhood of like being bullied or, you know, never knowing what people are saying about you. But the reality is like you are a strong, independent person. You live your own life. And if say on the off chance you were to have accidentally said something that offended someone or you were to have embarrassed yourself or made a fool of yourself, who cares? You know, we're all human beings. We all make mistakes. And what's furthermore is that not everyone needs to be, you know, pleased by you. Like you don't have to be a people pleaser. You don't have to be the right person for everyone. Like we are going to have people that we don't get along with. We're going to have people that, you know, don't get the vibes and that's okay. You know, we can't please everyone. We don't have to be Miss Popularity. And sometimes it's more important to just stick to your morals and values and standards and love yourself in those moments than it is to try to please everyone and, and be worried and fretting. And 99.9% .9 of the time, nothing ever has happened, at least in my case. 
if you have people reaching out to you the next day and they're like, oh my gosh, are you okay? You know, then maybe you need to do some reevaluating. But like, you know, if it's all in your head most of the time and you do have anxiety, then you just need to learn coping strategies to get through it. Because for me, anxiety can be something that's actually prolonging my hangover. Like it's what makes me throw up the next day. It's not, you know, it's not just the fact that I drink alcohol. It's like, it's the anxiety that becomes induced. It's almost like a literal panic attack. And I've had that happen several times. Um, one of which we're going to do a deep dive into, but yeah, so you have to be aware of how your brain is affecting you with the hangover, how your anxiety is affecting you and your decisions and your choices that you make when you're sober versus not sober. So I think there's a lot of discussion to be had there. I think a lot of the time, at least with my, myself, I can sometimes be like a nervous energy when it comes to, I, I don't want to say meeting new people because I am a bit of a yapper and I do like to meet new people and I find so much joy in that. But I would say in certain situations, like maybe with dating or maybe when there's higher stakes or if you think someone doesn't like you or you're going to a big party where you don't know anyone and you know you just are in these like social settings that can be awkward and so you have that like panic you know and I definitely experience that I think I'm like kind of like an ambivert I guess you would say maybe I flex in and out of being outgoing and wanting to be around people while also um you know needing to recharge at home too sometimes. And I feel like I definitely have a social battery at a certain point. I do need to just take like a minute to go home and just like collect my thoughts, recalibrate and do all that good stuff. But I think that sometimes with drinking, um, it can enable me like one or two drinks can enable me to just like shake off that, you know, anxiety that I have, um, that I otherwise, you know, it just adds stress to my life, but it's things that I need to get over or get through. Like say for instance, you're going to go on a date, you know, and you are feeling kind of like a little unwell because you're anxious about that date. You're like, Oh, what are they going to think of me? Will they think I'm ugly? Will I like, you know, do my makeup differently, do my hair differently. But then the reality is like, just like have one cocktail and then you'll be like more relaxed. You're not going to be inebriated. And you know, you just feel a little bit more at ease just like slightly because this is like a circumstantial anxiety that maybe is impeding you from doing something that you've been wanting to do long term. You know, I know so many people that just like never go on dates or never do anything like that because they're too anxious and I wouldn't want to fall down that rabbit hole myself. Obviously we can like have other strategies to mitigate our anxiety that are probably better than having a cocktail. But once in a while, you know, I, that's what I do. You know, once in a blue moon, I may have a cocktail. The last date I went on though was literally a coffee date middle of the day. And I didn't drink anything before that one. You know, I'm not like advocating for you to drink alcohol to solve your problems. That's not at all what I'm doing, but like, say for instance, tonight I'm going on a date and, um, it's just like a last minute spur of the moment thing, which I love. I don't like when there's like so much build up and then they bail on you or something like that. Um, but I'm going on a date. It's just going to be like a quick little patio bar nearby. And I might have a little, a little cocktail just before I go, just to like relax me. Otherwise, like I might want to bail myself from the state because it just kind of freaks me out when I overthink things. So if I have just like one drink, I'll be like, <clears throat> shake it out, you know, like get it out of your system and then just go and enjoy your time, meet this person and, you know, see if you click, if you click, you click, if you don't, you don't. And then you move on with your life, you know? So, um, that might be in my cards later, but speaking of, you know, panic attacks, drinking, anxiety, I have an iconic story time to tell you guys. It is pretty savage. It is the title of this podcast. I dumped my boyfriend over pizza. No word of a lie. It did happen last August and we're going to get into it. I normally have been keeping this kind of stuff private, but I will say like as a woman and specifically as a trans woman too, I feel like it's so important to talk about dating, to talk about experiences with men or just in general with relationships, because it's what helps us identify issues in our own lives and having that sense of community and that example from someone else can help us see things, um, in a bigger way and kind of clear our perception. If I didn't have friends that I could consult and talk to throughout my relationships, I would never know that um, some of my boundaries were being crossed in a really wrong, terrible way. And so I think it's so important that I talk about these things. Um, I've kept some of it private, some of it secret, and I'm not going to go into like huge, huge detail about who, what, where, when, but you guys will get all the tea. So flashback to 
the second weekend of August last summer. And I had my kind of situationship, I would say, ongoing for the better part of six years, if you can believe. Crazy jaw drop on the floor. Um, we kind of had this like mutual understanding for the past couple of years that like we weren't in a super committed relationship anymore. It wasn't that we were seeing other people, but it was that like there was no incentive for us to move in together or get married or do any of that stuff, which I kind of in hindsight look back at and go, hmm, like why did I hold on to that relationship for so long? I should have totally got out of that sooner. And it was a situation ship and maybe part of me was kind of looking for like an escape route. Um, but overall, um, it was just kind of one of those situations, like there wasn't a lot of value put into it, let's say for instance, but because of the length of time, I feel like it's like a, who are you kidding situation? Like, of course you value this person. And of course, you know, you've kept them around in your life and stuff like that. But we would kind of have ebbs and flows. Um, he would come over on the weekends sometimes and hang out and we would do things together. Sometimes he would do errands for me, like take me shopping and stuff like that. Um, just to like, he had a car. I didn't, you know, like we had a very symbiotic relationship. I felt in a lot of ways, um, in hindsight, I kind of feel like I offered way more than what he did. Um, but sometimes when you're in relationships like that, which can be a little bit manipulative, you don't really see the full picture and you, you overvalue what they are offering you because you're more afraid of having no one in your life and being alone than you are of accepting the attention and the, um, you know, the relationship that they offer you, you know? And so you kind of become complacent and used to that. Um, but all I'm saying is like, this wasn't someone that I was like living with. It wasn't someone that I was like intertwined with like this. We would see each other like several times a month and it would be like mostly on the weekends and, and then nothing throughout the week most of the time. So, um, that was like the painting the picture moment before this weekend. Um, but leading up to this weekend and the beginning part of this weekend, things started to become more romantic again. We had moments where it was really romantic. I had moments where he literally referred to me as his wife to like acquaintances, like I guess as a joke, but who the F does that? So cringe, so disgusting. If you're not going to put a ring on it and you cannot call me your wife, like it was only done like maybe a couple of times, but I remember I had a problem with that. Um, it was just like weird behavior, right? Like who does that? Like you're insane. It's kind of giving like psychotic, toxic love bombing where like you will pretend something, but then do the opposite, you know, like you'll, you'll act as if things are one way, but then your actions completely tell the truth. Anyway. So he started becoming more romantic with me leading up to this weekend. Um, he started taking me out more to dinners, paying for everything, taking me on little park dates. Um, he like took me to go and get Elio groomed and like paid for part of it. And he was just being more romantic, wanting to hold my hand and being more, more forward with his affection in a way. Um, mind you, like he had never, like we, we didn't have like a, I love you relationship at this point. Cause it had kind of like, I don't want to say deteriorated, but it was what it was. Like, um, we had, I had tried to break up with him several times and he kept crawling back basically is what it is. Um, and did I stop it from happening again? No, just like, you know, those we've all, I don't know if we've all been there, but like a lot of us have been there where you're in this situation ship that just doesn't end and it keeps lingering. And it's honestly the worst thing you can do because the minute you're out of that and you move on, you look back and you go, wow, like years of my life were stolen from me by this situation ship. Like I could have just moved on and done my own thing a long time ago. Like it was a dead end. Like I should not have prolonged that. But anyways, let's get into the nitty gritty of the weekend. So, um, he was kind of like being more romantic, right? And we were having this almost renaissance in our relationship that I felt was like starting to develop again. And maybe in relationships you have ebbs and flows of like romance of, you know, dates and having that passion again. And maybe you have dry spells too. That's, that's also normal, but obviously what I've described is not typical. And so it wasn't necessarily a typical situation. But then again, when you're on that roller coaster, you get sucked back in by these more romantic periods that you go through. And so, um, we were kind of having that moment, but still like we were at this point where he would just come on weekends, kind of hang out at my apartment, like 
use my gaming PC to play video games um, that we both like enjoyed together, but then like go do his own thing. Like whether that was like biking or volleyball or whatever, like it was very like utilitarian for him to stay here. Cause he didn't live in the city. He lived just out of the city and like, you know, it was convenient to him. Like I really, you know, I afforded him a lot of conveniences by allowing him to stick around in my life. And I feel like I didn't, you know, get enough of a, um, I I don't want to say pat on the back, but enough of acknowledgement from him about that. Like it was almost like he always felt like he was doing me favors when in reality, like I offered so much to the relationship on my own spectrum of things. So always know your worth and then you'll know like when something's out of whack. But basically, um, this weekend had come up, um, I had plans throughout the weekend and this was like the weird part of our relationship too is that like I would have my own plans and he would kind of come in and out of my life like at his own will. Everything was like by his schedule and he would just come in and hang out at my apartment while I would go do other things like with my weekend because you know I didn't want to dedicate um, my whole weekend to just you know hanging out with him every time because I have friends and I have a social life and he honestly really didn't. So I had plans to go to the beach and have a party with friends. I had plans to go for brunch with a friend and her parents that I hadn't seen in a while. So I was doing all these things while he was just kind of chilling at my apartment. Like, luckily, he was also able to, like, you know, take Elio out for washroom breaks and whatever and, like, help out in, like, little ways like that. But by and large, he was just someone who was, like, squatting in my apartment while I I was just living my life, you know, kind of weird. But regardless... Um, I went, I had this brunch with my friend and her parents and it was at a really nice like French restaurant and there were so many leftovers. They didn't want any of it because, uh, they were like heading back home or doing a lot of walking that day and whatever. And they didn't want to carry it around. It wasn't going to last. And I lived in the area. So they just said, take all of it. Honestly, it was a lot of food. It was like a whole carton of like, you know, sausage, like gourmet, by the way, like gourmet Parisian sausage, uh, potato, <laughs> potatoes, um, eggs, like all these like sides and things. And it was like a heavy, big box. Like I'm not exaggerating. Like it really was a heavy, big box. Um, I swear this is all going to have a reason and a purpose. So I take this box eventually and bring it back to my ex who's sitting at my apartment. Right. And he's not really, he's kind of like been a little bit frugal throughout our relationship, but I'm not going to like, you know, belittle him for that. Like we all have our reasons and like whatever, but he like hadn't eaten anything. And I was thinking like, Oh, like it's so nice that I can bring him back some of this food. Um, because I was out doing things while he was just sitting in my apartment, like, you know, doing nothing or whatever. And so I brought him, you know, the food and he ate all of it. I thought he was only going to eat like a portion of it, but I won't judge him for that because like I did say like, you know, have as much as you want, but he like definitely like binged the whole thing and ate all of it. And I was like, oh, well, whatever. Like I have more pizza in the fridge. I have more pizza in the fridge, so it's fine. And the pizza that I do have is gourmet from Blondie's, not sponsored by the way. My Blondie's pizza is in the fridge and... I already have some leftovers, so if he wanted to eat, you know, two sausages, bacon, huge helpings of potatoes, eggs, baked beans, whatever the hell was in this box, like all these things from multiple people's dishes at this brunch that I went to, like this huge tub, I'm not going to say anything. It's fine. Like have all of it, like whatever. And this definitely was my mindset. Like I was very generous. I was like, oh my gosh, like, you know what? Like you must've been so hungry, like have all of it, whatever. So he does. And I had, I I believe I had also ordered us Uber Eats the night before that we ate. So anyways, there was that. And then there was the brunch. And then I was like, okay, now I'm going to go to this beach party. And he's like, what time will you be back? And I said, maybe around six or seven. And then I left to go to this beach party. I don't invite him to these things, you guys. And you know why I don't invite him? Because we are a situation ship, you know? You don't get the privilege of coming in and out of my life like a prairie dog and then coming and hanging out with my friends at parties and going to social gatherings and spending time with my family. I'm not yo-yoing you in like that and degrading my own self-worth by like having you come in and out as you please, you know? So I very much was like having this separate life from him. And then I would see him occasionally, but he wouldn't come to anything I would do. And we didn't have any kind of like strong, strong attachment at that point. But like, it was kind of like a relationship. 
it almost sounds like a secret relationship, doesn't it? But it wasn't a secret. And like, I would go and see his family, but like, you know, when you don't meet certain standards, it's like, you know, we've been seeing each other for six years and you don't want to live with me, you know, all this stuff. Why would I, you know, bring you to all these events and things like that's embarrassing for me. Like, no, thank you. Not going to happen. Um, and you think you would have got the hint, but honestly he was totally fine to not go to these things. I don't even think he wanted to, like I said, he was not very social. So I didn't even like think that he would want to be invited. And he honestly never said he did. So it was this not even part of the story, right? So basically, I go to the beach. I'm hanging out with a bunch of girls. We're all, like, drinking high noons. We're just vibing on the beach. We have tequila shots. It's kind of a fun summer August Saturday. And we're getting Saturdays. And it's so fun. We're literally playing beer pong in the sand, just living our best lives, you know? And I'm having so much fun um, when an annoying, irritating buzzing sound starts coming from my purse. And it's my ex. And he's messaging me um, because it's now 6 o'clock. And he's like, when are you coming home? You said you'd be home by now. Blah, 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 blah. And then all of a sudden he tells me that his cousin, who he was planning on giving a ride home to... Um, is now at my apartment um, and he's waiting and how dare I not come back right at six so I'm like at the beach having fun with my friends thinking wow like this man is like in my apartment camping in my apartment on a Saturday literally just like playing video games doing whatever he wanted to do with his day um, just like you know using my apartment as he pleased he didn't have to stay at my apartment during the day you know he didn't have to be there he didn't have to be you know hanging out with my dog doing whatever he wanted to do and by the way this was all his choice um, but now he's like trying to rein me in and bring me home. And I literally say to him, Oh, sorry. Like, um, we're just having fun. I, I didn't realize it was such a big deal that like I get back right at six or whatever time it was. It was either six or seven. I can't remember now. It's been almost a year, but basically long story short, I start calling an Uber. We're going to head back from the beach anyways, because you know, it's, when it starts to get the evening, you don't want to be on the beach. It gets cold, whatever. And I'm like, guys, I, I got to go back now. Like, you know, my ex, I wasn't my ex at the time, but so-and-so is waiting for me. And so I call the Uber and everything, but like, I'm obviously going to Uber with multiple people. So it takes them a minute, you know, like, and then we all get in the Uber. I head home. I'm, I would say I, I got back maybe around 30 to 40 minutes later than what I said I would be back. I didn't realize there was such an urgency and I still to this day don't think there was an urgency. I think that again, it was my ex trying to exert control and trying to be demanding. He never said like why he had to drive his cousin. He never said his cousin had to be somewhere for something. It was a Saturday and they were just driving back to his place in Mississauga and it was like six or seven on a Saturday. Like there, there was no communication as to what it was for. And I feel like he was just trying to exert some level of control over me. And he was just demanding that I come back. And I even said to him, if it's a big deal, just leave my keys on the counter and leave my door unlocked. I'm going to be home in 30 minutes. Like, don't worry about it. Um, which is what he ended up doing, but he made a big deal about it until he ended up doing that. So like I said to do that right away and he only, he waited like a half an hour for me, I think. And then he like left it on the counter, but he was like, just so like miffed, so angry at me in the text combo. And like, I'll take fault for like not coming back right on time, like right at six or seven or whenever it was, I came back like a half an hour to 40 minutes after that, but there was no kind of, there was no promise. There was no, I'll be back right at this time because I know it's so important that you drive your cousin somewhere. There was none of that. Like we didn't have that contract. There was no confirmation of that. And he then tells me after I get in that he fed his cousin and himself, I'm pretty sure, all of my leftovers from Blondie without even asking me, which is the pizza place. So it all comes full circle, folks. And when you come off the beach bedraggled and haggard and you look like a swamp rat, you are starving. And the only thing that you've been suckling on the teat of is a tequila bottle. Like you need sustenance. And not only did my Parisian leftovers from brunch get completely scarfed and devoured, stuff that I thought maybe I would have a little bit left over so that I could have later, but he fed his cousin all of my pizza, which honestly, nice pizza place, Blondie's, look it up in Toronto, recommend their pizza, so delicious, cold girl hot drink, no, cold drink hot girl, I can't remember what it's called, something like that, 
But basically, he fed his cousin my pizza, and my fridge was empty. And I remember, like, I had, like, been drinking a little bit, right? So I'm not 100% in my right mind, and I was kind of mad about it. I was like, what the hell? I was like, you honestly, you know, I started fighting with him a little bit. I was like, you honestly, like, did not have to eat my pizza. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm hungry. Like, I have nothing to eat now. Like, can you at least Uber me something? Because, you know, you literally gave my food. Actually, I don't even think I said, can you Uber me something? I think at the time I had asked him, I said, oh, well, after you're done dropping your cousin off, do you want to come back and we can Uber something to eat? Because I wanted to imply that like, hey, like I got us food on Friday night. I brought you all my leftovers on Saturday after brunch, which I went to and you were just waiting at my apartment, not doing anything to get food yourself. And then you fed your cousin and ate my pizza Like, literally, (laughs) I know, I can't believe we're having this conversation. But basically, you fed your cousin my leftover pizza, which was expensive. And I just feel like I've sponsored the entire weekend. And I just was reaching this breaking point, like, leading up to this moment, right? I told you guys, like, I felt like things were becoming more romantic again. And he started doing some things for me. Um, And now it was, like, all of a sudden, like, one thing goes wrong. He wants to exert control. He starts being a huge douche. And he doesn't realize, like, hey, like, I've been sponsoring this whole weekend I've paid for everything I brought you leftovers like I did this 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 and he refused to like come back to my apartment to hang out he refused to you know have anything to do with me getting food or anything like that he refused to like offer to get me anything from uber um and that was just like a red flag to me because like I thought he would have been like oh sorry like you know I wasn't thinking he was trying to punish me like he literally said to me like you should have been back like 30 minutes ago. Like, how dare you like come late? It's so disrespectful. Like he was trying to like punish me for having a life while he was like, you know, raining terror from my apartment and just like being the overlord. And it was just bizarre behavior. Like, I don't understand. I don't understand, you know, the mindset of someone doing something like that. It was just giving like control tactics at the end of the day. Cause I thought he would have been happy to come back, you know, and be like, oh, you know, like, sure, I'll come back. Like, I feel bad that we ate the pizza. Um, Don't worry. You know, like, I know you were late um, and whatever. And, like, I, you know, I know you were late. And, like, I think I apologized. I'm pretty sure. I can't quite remember. But, like, it just wasn't a big deal. It was, like, a half an hour. And I know it wasn't because he didn't tell me what he was taking his cousin to. Like, there was never confirmation of that, you know? You know when you know? He was just trying to be a jerk. And he refused to come back. I think he was probably mad that I was out doing things all day. And he was sitting at my apartment playing video games and whatever. And I wasn't giving him attention. I don't know. I think he was just bitter. I think he was maybe bitter that I was out on the beach partying and having fun. And he wasn't there. I'm not sure. But either way, he did not come back to my apartment. And that's when I literally had an epiphany moment. I don't know if it was the drinking tequila on the beach. I don't know if it was something else, but I had this like out of body experience and I was like, it's never going to get better. Like this is your life. Like being, you know, pressured to come back to your own apartment early, being yelled at when you rush back and having your food eaten out of your fridge, having a gremlin just like marching around your apartment, calling the shots, not paying a dime of rent, but like, you know, enjoying your relationship, enjoying your apartment, enjoying your conveniences. And it's never going to get better. Like he was being more romantic and still this happened, you know, like I had to realize that, that he was actually so toxic and it was never going to go anywhere good. And so I literally had that epiphany moment. I sent him this like one text message where I basically was like, I deserve so much better than this. Like blah, 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 you know, like the classic. And then I blocked him on everything. I blocked him on Instagram. I blocked him on Facebook, on text message, on pretty much every single platform you can block on. And that lasted for about four hours, I would say. And then I had a panic attack and I'm like, oh my God, I feel so bad. I shouldn't have blocked him on everything. Like I'm going to apologize. And that's what happens sometimes when you're in a toxic relationship. You regret standing up for yourself. You regret setting a boundary and you regret like expressing how someone makes you feel. And so then you, you know, try to take it back. You try to apologize. You try to take the blame for the situation and fix everything so that you can go back to having whatever normalcy you had beforehand. So I tried to then contact him four hours later. I unblocked him and tried to message him back, but I didn't realize it. But like a week later, like I realized none of my texts went through because he had blocked me back on everything. He 
he had blocked me back on everything, ladies and gentlemen. So it was meant to be. High drama, but that's how that relationship ended. Six years, and it was just one night of blocking on everything. And I know it sounds so toxic from my end, like, oh, you all of a sudden just blocked someone on everything after six years. But I felt like that was the only way, like, looking back. Like, when I realized he had blocked me back on everything, I, like, said to myself, this is your chance to finally be free. There had been moments in the past, like, many times where, like, I tried to break things off with him, but he always kept coming back. Like either it was like a drunk 2 a.m. phone call or it was like sending me packages in the mail or showing up outside of my house. Like I know what you guys are going to say and it does kind of sound stalkery. I was never like afraid or anything. Like I just think he was being like, you know, dramatic, but like it was kind of giving like a, a little bit like, you know, uncomfortable vibes. Right. Um, and he would continue to do that actually, like after I had blocked him on everything. Right. Um, And so even just this past Christmas, I got a package in the mail and it's just like strange little weird things. I think he's moved on now and it's been several months and everything's fine. And like, I've moved on with my life, but yeah, that was like how that happened. Um, pretty crazy. It was literally over pizza. Him and his cousin ate my leftover pizza and I was like, that's it. I'm done. It's over. You're going to eat my pizza. I'm going to block you on everything. Because that's how I feel about pizza. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) But yes, it was savage, but it was also something that needed to happen. I think what I had to do was really unpack mentally. Like, why did I do this? Like, why did I blow up over him eating my pizza? It wasn't just the pizza. The pizza was a metaphor for the destruction and the desecration and the complete consumption of my soul in this relationship. I was the cold drink, hot girl pizza, and I was being devoured and I needed to get out of there. So where does that bring me now? Well, it's been a long, long 10 months of like a dry spell. It's not to say that like I haven't been on the apps and stuff and I haven't talked to people, but I think when you were in something for six years, you need a moment to recalibrate and readjust like what do I want out of life? What do I want out of a partner? And, you know, just finding your like self-worth again is so important. And I just feel like I'm on that journey. And I don't know, I don't have like an answer for you guys. I went on my first date like a couple weeks ago and it was just like a nice coffee date. Um, but it didn't end up really going anywhere. And then I have a date tonight, so we'll see how that goes. But it's really like the wild west out there. Sometimes you forget when you were in something for so long, like what it's really like to be back on the market, especially as a trans girl. There's just so much rejection. There's so much disinterest and there's so much like just ships passing in the night. Like someone might be interested in me, but then I, in that moment, I'm busy. And then when I reach out back to them, maybe they're busy and then that's why they don't get back to me. So, and that happens all the time. Like we're struggling out here. It's so hard to find someone and have things just mesh. And sometimes when it's last minute, it's the best case scenario. And that's kind of what I'm doing tonight. So I hope it goes well, but I'm kind of in this weird place because in my last relationship, I literally went into it like as one person and left as a completely different person. I had two major surgeries during that relationship. I had a boob job and I had my vagina surgery and that was like something that completely changed my perception of myself too. So I don't really know what it's like to date with my current body. I don't know what category I fit into. I don't know how people view me. And I just feel like I'm relearning everything again for the first time. And it's kind of scary that way. And I want to honor myself and give myself the benefit of the doubt. But at the same time, I just, I don't know. I'm just kind of fielding things out. And I think a lot of us are in this position where you just don't really know what you're looking for, but you're hoping it's out there. (laughs) Anyways, you guys, I think that's pretty much it for today's podcast episode. You got the truth tea on my longest and most, I don't want to say most tumultuous relationship because there was a lot of good moments in that relationship. It definitely degraded towards the end, but you got the tea. And if you guys enjoyed this, let me know because I could do so many more story times for you guys. Um, I love Gavin. I love talking about it. And I love just kind of like taking lessons. I feel like it's almost like therapy for me to just hang out with you guys and chat and vibe. We're not doing brain boost today because I just, I didn't feel like making a cocktail this early in the day. 
Um, and I don't have a mocktail in mind, but there'll definitely be another bra- brain boost segment <laughs> in a future podcast. Um, let me know what you guys thought of today's solo of what you thought of, you know, just like the relationship topics. And if you have any suggestions for what you would like me to talk about or topics you'd like me to cover, I am so open to it. Like whether that's like, you know, just trans issues that you want me to talk about or, you know, just hot topics, controversial things that are going on in the world. I feel like my two favorite brain rot things at the moment are the, um, four seasons Orlando baby me and show me to me, Rachel, show me to me. If you guys know, you know, your brain is just as rotted as mine. Stay gorgeous. Everyone remember that, you know, being alone and being on your own is better than being in a situation that breaks you down and takes you down because you were someone before you ever were in your first relationship and you can reconnect with that someone after a relationship. You do not need someone else to complete you. (laughs) I just had a flashback to Ramona from Real Housewives of New York. I need a man to hold me and love me and want me and I'm worried I'm never going to find it again. It's literally how I feel sometimes, but it's normal. We go through those waves. Like sometimes we're like independent woman and then we're like, I need a man. So I don't know what the future has in store for me. I, I don't know, but that's life. You just don't know. And, uh, I think I'm finally moving through this hump. I'm going on dates again. It's been many, many months. And I think that just putting yourself out there is so important. You're going to get rejected. You're going to feel like shit. But all you have to do is know that you love yourself and you're an awesome person. You can hang out in your own company and enjoy it. And so therefore, you know, you don't need someone else to validate that. And if you love yourself, if someone is, you know, demeaning towards you, rejects you, or makes you try to feel worse about yourself, you can just say, I don't know why you feel that way, sir, because I actually really like myself. I'm a quality person. I have great friends, I have great family, and I really value who I spend my time with. And if you can't see the value that I bring to a relationship, it just means we're not compatible and it's not a commentary on me. It's commentary on how you see me. Mic drop. Thank you guys so much for joining this Brain Rot podcast and I will see you guys next time. Happy brain rotting.